And I want to go back over some of that briefly, just to remind you of some of the bits we have to attend to today. Today, what we're doing is we're looking at the parts of ourselves that get caught in drama and what to do about that. So it dictates our ability to manage our emotions. 
all of which are behind these belief systems. It also dictates our ability to determine what ever needs those emotions are alerting us to. So for example, give a simple example. Let's pose, um, in fact, I'll give another example further down the track, but I want to give a different one. <clears throat> Let's suppose our partner says, um, I, want to go, I want us to go to bed now. Right? And you aren't quite ready for that. So what happens then is, first of all, because of your attachment style, you're likely to hear that as a criticism or an expectation or a pressure or an implied message that in fact you don't normally come to bed when I want you to go to bed and it really annoys me and so I'm saying I want you to come to bed now and actually that's not really what you're saying but you're, it's interpreted as what you're saying and so you can then start an argument when actually nothing happened. So this is a norm. This is normally what happens. So then what happens is our emotions get triggered. And our emotions aren't triggered because of our partner in that moment. Our emotions are triggered because of our history, our childhood. So what we're going to do is we're going to have an emotional trigger at that moment that's got absolutely nothing really to do with the circumstances. It's almost like we were right and ready to be triggered. Now those triggers we have to know and own. We can't go through life completely reacting because actually not only does it cause arguments, it's exhausting. We're constantly, there's a tension about dealing with people. Because we can't just be ourselves, we have to feel like we're on tenderhooks being ready to defend ourselves or ready to do something. So it dictates our ability to determine whatever needs these emotions are learning us to because it overrides them. So if you say, well actually I'd like to stay up for a while and watch something, or I'd like to um, just wind down, whatever it is your need is, that very likely gets varied for two or three reasons, which I'm going to go over again, say it now again later. The first is you may not even know it. Secondly, you will forget it in the heat of the argument because you're too busy in the argument. And thirdly, you're likely to amend your need based on that drama. Stay up this time, I'll talk about it, quietly go off and do something without your partner um, knowing what you're doing. We, all, we develop these strategies to get around this emotional drama. It's endless. We do not realize how much emotional drama we're in, because a lot of it's low level. We're particularly at work and so on, we grit our teeth, bite our tongue, and we just get on with it because we can't really process things and splurt all over people, our emotional patterns. So a lot of our life we just Hold that on what our needs are. And then there's this piece, you remember, the relating skills or lack thereof. So what happens is we've got these, um, this our, it determines our ability to stay calm, first of all, because we've got to be able to calm to be able to relate. And secondly, it determines our ability to express our emotions usefully, which most of the time we don't even know. Thirdly, it determines our ability to listen to so that others feel heard and understood, which very, very few of us have been taught, and most of us are not good at, because in actual fact, another person talking makes us really, really anxious about what about my view, or I have a thing to say, or you just triggered something I wanted to say. So what happens, it's really, really hard to stay balanced listening to somebody else. And lastly, it determines how well we stay calm and support another who is not calm. Now, most of us are not good at the last bit. We struggle to keep us calm, let alone our partner. So, we're up against it. So, here's a quick summary that relate of the dynamics we're dealing with. Two personalities who want to express their own needs, preferences and wants clash due to the fact they're different, which of course is invisible to them, mostly. One personality is usually more empowered than the other. Now that's almost inevitable. And it's not a norm, it's not, it's, it's the way people are wired. So, but people don't know that. They don't know their partner is disempowered, or that their partner is more empowered because of the way their attachment style works. They don't know that. Thirdly, so one pushes their own view, while the other resists, fight back, fights back, or gives up. That's sort of the consequence of the invisible power struggle. And fourthly, such debates are usually based on reason, logic, 
and thus better powers the avoidant. Most arguments are not, and not about how I'm feeling, they're about logical reasons for things to be done this way or that way. So thus, the anxious and secure person is disadvantaged. They are not as good at reason argument and so struggle to hold their own. Now normally they don't know that. Normally the anxious person does not know they're structured not to be able to argue logically as well as their avoidant partner. <clears throat> because they don't know this. They just don't see that this is a pattern. Basically, the anxious secure person is really wired to be emotional and talk emotion. So the anxious and secure person usually has an emotional position which such debates discount or negate, usually generating anxious, possibly anxiety, then possibly anger, or closing down in order to remain safe. So the anxious person is either going to fire up or close down most of the time because of an empowerment difficulty. <clears throat> it's not that they can't be empowered, it's just that their pattern is being growing up to always look after and consider other people first. So it makes it very difficult to empower yourself when you don't want to be unkind, unpleasant, and so on. Until you've lost it and then you just throw it to them. Oh. What's the classic scenario that you talk to couples about that showcases that point now. We're going to get to one in a minute, but I'll use one that's different than the one we're coming to in a minute. So, can, can you wait till the one that comes, because it takes it step by step, it might be easier. Is that right? So, uh, just coming out. So an argument involving different stars and cues, it cannot reach a balanced conclusion because two different stars are involved and they're invisible. So I think the next slide, but no, it's just out of this. So there is now a downward slide towards promoting and prioritizing one's own needs, preferences and wants. One's sense of self is on the line. So you've basically got a difficulty. If you want to be yourself, you have to fight. You have to fight or ramp up or try and speak later. Or, that's, a, that's particularly for the anxious style. If you're an avoidant, you're likely to say, well, she, she usually she is ridiculous, crazy, it's, uh, it's, it's an obvious what I'm saying is obviously true. Uh, she doesn't get where I'm coming from. She doesn't understand this. So avoidance very much back their own logical reasoned viewpoint, which can drive the anxious style up the wall. So number nine, this drama creates resentment, bitterness, and disrespect. But these are seen as these are seen as behaviours such as contempt, belligerence, defensiveness, withdrawing, stonewalling, or criticism. Now, these are important. A number of years ago, a couples researcher called John Gottman did research with couples to find out what was going on. He actually gave them a, a, a venue to live in for a weekend, and he videotaped them. They knew they were being videotaped, of course, and then they... Then they um, went through these videotapes and they realized that actually there are patterns that are going on that predict the downfall of a relationship. And he came up with four, four behaviors that he predicted would mean the end of the relationship within two years. He called them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Great man for those behaviors. Then two years later, a couple of years, a short time later, he realized there were two more. Those six are all the ones he identified. When you're doing any of those, you're doing things that are likely to bring the end of the relationship sooner or later. Number 10. Couples soon see each other through this veil of resentment, unconsciously viewing their mate as the enemy rather than someone they love. The relationship is now doomed because you're now seeing it through the lens of the, the arguments and so on, rather than seeing your, your partner as someone you love. So it feels like you're being with the enemy and you start to treat the person you're with as someone you have to defend yourself against. You can see why it's a problem. This in general is where all relationships go most of the time. 
There are things that people do to avoid this, and I'm going to come to those later because I want you to do, to do them. But generally speaking, most couples head down a track like this, and that's why relationships are so cyclic. That's why we go through so many relationships in our lifetime, because we don't see this invisible pattern at work. So I'll get to it. And in a minute, to what you, I, I do have an example to show how this works. But I want to talk about needs first. We each have needs, preferences, and wants. At best, these get expressed as preferences, desires, hopes, and dreams, but at worst, they may not be expressed at all. Because either we're not in touch with them or we don't feel we can say it. So our partner may also be compromising their needs and preferences. So there's a whole lot going on that's not even being talked about. But no one knows because it's invisible, it's slowly resentments and so on develop behind the scenes. So thirdly, our challenge is to consider both partners' needs without surrendering our own. However, this requires calm negotiating skills which few have ever learned. Now that's an important statement. We have to recognize both sets of needs, but it requires a lot of tolerance and patience to be able to do that because we fear that we're going to be overridden, or not listened to, or pushed aside. So number four, the power differences and perception differences about what each is wanting start to arise. We fear our needs won't be met, and that we'll be disempowered. Self-beliefs may tell us we'll be overlooked, deprioritized, or compelled to do something unwanted, triggering our reactivity. So fundamentally, the fact that we're, we've got the power differences, perception differences about even what's going on, feeling criticizing me when actually I, that person's not being criticized, that means when that happens, it, it triggers these self beliefs about me being overlooked, being prioritized, or being proud to do something that I don't want to do. That gets us to be reactive. Here's an example of the sort of Francis was asking for. So let's look at this example. This is fairly typical, and you'll see, it would be surprising if all of us don't relate to this because it's fairly, fairly typical. So he wants to go out with his mates and she wants time together at home. So it's called, we call that, my business, a needs clash. So step one, he states his desire to go out and relax. Now the relaxed part, he won't state. He's likely to simply say, I just want to go out. So already, not enough is being said because the relaxed bit is the need. There's a need to relax. But that often doesn't get said, so the need isn't articulated and the partner doesn't get why he wants to go out. She states her desire for him to be at home, and the connection is her need that also isn't stated. It's implied that it's not stated. So he doesn't get that she's getting upset and concerned if he goes out that they won't be connecting. He doesn't know that's where she's coming from because it usually doesn't get stated, largely because we're just not used to stating our needs. So step two, if the, avoid, if the, if the avoidance is secure, he reasons or justifies his position. So he'll say something like, I want to go out with my mates, it's what I do each week, um, it's my way of um, communicating with my friends, or whatever, whatever, he will use reason. However, her style, if she's the anxious girl style, she bears disconnection or unimportance. So what's happening here is she's going to fear disconnection or being unimportant to him, which has got nothing to do with why he's going out or, or what he will do when he goes out. So in other words, that's an invisible need that she doesn't state and he doesn't know. Normally it's not stated. So you can see that what's happening is in step two, they're using their attachment style to justify what they're doing. He's using reason, typical of the avoidance, and she's wanting emotional closeness, typical of the anxious and secure. However, the, the true reasons behind what they're wanting to do are not stated. So now we're heading down a track because invisibility is going to take over. We're now inviting reactivity because in actual fact statements made are really not statements that are clear. 
Step three, he feels anxious, criticised by her objections, gets defensive, feels controlled, closes down, and maybe walks out. She feels anxious, upset, but probably doesn't say so or why, and eventually gets angry and perhaps accusatory. Now, step three is the very standard drama that's, that acts out in most relationships all the time. But that's all that you see. You only get to see that part, the rest is invisible. The stuff beforehand is invisible, and the stuff to follow is invisible. And he probably wouldn't realise that he's feeling anxious. Yeah. Yeah. No. Same with the woman. Correct. So those feelings would be invisible, yeah. normally. So all that happens is people hear the consequence. And you look at that number, step three, so criticism is in there, avoiding is in there, defensive is in there, the angry is in there, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are very, very present. So normally step three is the only that couples know they're doing. All the rest under the radar. Step four. So he now withdraws resentfully, feeling controlled and trapped. She feels hurt and upset that she's not a priority. Now these are feelings, so he probably doesn't know he's resentful. He probably doesn't know he's defensive. And she probably doesn't know that she's hurt and upset. She may do, but she's less likely to state it. She may in the thirty parts of the relationship state it. But he will be mystified by that. If she says, I feel hurt that you're not staying home with me, he will think, how can you be hurt that I'm not staying home? Like, it won't resonate for him. Because normally for most of the audience, hurt isn't a key emotion. And also, he's not trying to do anything to her. So when she says she feels hurt, that's a bit mysterious to him because he didn't try to hurt her. So he's less likely to take responsibility and he will then probably not bother empathising with where she's at. He'll, be, he'll feel like that's just hopeless. No point in going there. She's upset. We're stuffed. I'll just leave. Step five. He sits with his resentment, thinking negatively about it. Boy, he's very good at doing this. They stop. I can remember walking around the block, thinking negative, 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 until I got off the chest. And then when I come down and I would come back, walk back in the door. I can remember that pattern of that, all that negative thinking. And that negative thinking had nothing to do with the situation usually. It had everything to do with how she is this, this, this a lot of the time. Right? So in other words, I got, I got caught up in, in actually expanding my thinking to cover all the things that would go on in the relationship. I did that too. I can remember almost on a regular basis, usually by about 11 o'clock on a Saturday, I just get the hell out of the house right. and leave him behind. So that you just described, because your style is more the anxious style. So what you described is becoming avoidant. So the anxious style will sometimes become avoidant um, in order to also give up on the drama. Any questions? You don't want to ask them? Well, I've been running away from home since being three years old because it was all chaos right. there. So I was just replaying this. You know, <coughs> yeah, that's whenever it was just like too full on until you find somebody who will stay in the room with you and say, well, look, we could have a better morning. There aren't, many, out what's going there aren't many with those schools around. I've left him at home this morning, but he's doing all right. Okay. Questions? No? We'll come back to this. We can go back over. So only the six steps. So number five then, he's thinking resentfully, and she sees him withdraw and feels hurt or upset that he's abandoned her and that he controls this relationship. So what she's doing is she's interpreting, A, he's disinterested in me because he's walked out, he's doing this with what he wants, this relationship now totally fits whatever he wants, I'm just going to stay, to stay at home and put up with it. So now it's moved from him feeling controlled by her to her feeling controlled by him. Basically, everyone's being in control by everyone. Number six. He eventually explodes or walks out on her. She gets angry at this rejection again and feels unloved and may shut what he hears as criticism. 
In other words, he may just even ramp up and say, I, I don't, I feel unloved, or I just want you here, I just want us to talk, or whatever. You're here, it's criticism, and if he's the standard of all Does this make sense as to how this plays out? It's very, very important. Now, in your books, on page 242, I want you to start writing down what you realize goes on for you too. The crucial bits I want you to write down are the bits that you are aware happen emotionally. Do I get hurt? Do I get um, anxious that I can't talk? Do I get defensive and pull away? Like that's the bit that's crucial. You've done well. You told us about the homework. Yes, yeah, I did. Yeah. so good. Yes, I did. But I want to go over this for you to add stuff because I know not everyone's done it. Um, that's okay. It's so good that you're here. Okay. Well done. Yeah. Oh, cheers. Where's my gold star? I need a gold star. Hey. Gold star. Gold star. <laughs> Katie did it right. <laughs> Half a star. <laughs> okay. Time out, which is a need, to de-stress, 
so dead that we're working week or something like that, taking time out to de-stress, we get irritable and bark orders to someone when our emotions get triggered. So, instead of looking after our relaxed state, um, we start to find ourselves reacting. I'll give you a good example of when I did this just in the last 24 hours. Our dog, fortunately not my wife, our dog gets in, under my feet. You know, typical of a dog just lies anywhere. So what happened is I tripped over the dog um, and then I dropped a couple of plates which smashed and I was really furious. Now of course, this is a good example of where I got stressed because something didn't go my way. So I really had a need for a clear passage. And I did ask the dog to move, but the dog actually did not do much that he was asked to do because he's not actually very good at obeying orders from anyone. So which also got me bothered because in fact, he, it triggered the fact that actually this is a habit because he doesn't do this regularly. And so I'm really annoyed not only about this incident, but all the other incidents where this goes on. And you see how we get triggered. So when what a need isn't met, frequently a whole lot of unmet needs trigger an emotional reaction. Okay. So needs are overlooked often because we are simply not trying to ask calmly and clearly for these to be met. We may also have learned to override or not notice them because it's a risk of raising. And wants are usually unconsciously driven. So we may seek to have these met even if they are destructive, but they are an alternative to meeting needs. So for example, we might use alcohol as a way to cope with the stress of the week. So instead of actually going to the gym which would get things off our chest or talking to our partner or going for a walk which would be meeting needs, we get them met by a want, which generally speaking, wants are an alternative and lesser not as good an option relative to needs. So we get lots of wants met, and most substance abuse is actually about overriding needs. I had a client this week, really lovely young woman, grew up with parents who were dictatorial, learned to close down and not get her needs met. She really was, is, she's what I call a closet connector, she really should be a connector like the anxious and sickest style. But because she grew up with parents who weren't interested in hearing what she had to say, she became avoidant. Now what happens for her is that if she gets worked up, she's not been used to talking about her needs. She had no one who met them. She had no one who read what her, where she was at. So what she did is she learned to do things in an avoidant way very early on. As a late teenager, she started drinking, and frequently get people get into drink or drugs or something because it's an alternative to actually expressing needs, getting heard, understood, and so on. Okay, so a couple of examples. Instead of getting a problem off our chest by say talking about it, which is a need, we have a drink instead, which is a want. Second example, instead of connecting lovingly with our partner, which is a need, we get that need to met more easily by spending time with a work colleague and maybe sliding into an affair, which is a displaced need. In other words, we're not getting the need met where we would like to get met, so we get it met elsewhere. But you'd have to ask, well, why don't we get it met at home? Like, why don't we get it met with our partner? Because we've blocked it off, or we feel it's not possible, or we don't want to raise an argument. In other words, for some reason, we don't get the need met where, in fact, we met with someone and married them, perhaps, to get those needs met, but that gets completely lost over time. Okay. I'm going to get you to just talk about this in a minute. But I just want to go through this first. So here are the issues. The issues in blue I talked about last week. So demanding, controlling versus relaxed or feeling controlled. Let's suppose we've got that drama going on. Solution, discuss your needs and preferences. Respect and negotiate differences. And you can see it's the same solution for every problem. Perfectionism versus less perfect. Discuss the need, discuss preferences, respect and negotiate differences. If there's a substance abuse, 
or use going on versus no substance use, solution, discuss your need, discuss your preferences. Virtually the discussion of needs and preferences is the solution to every, every situation. That's provided you feel you can. That's provided you feel you're going to be listened to. That's provided you know actually how to articulate your need. Can you see it's not so straightforward. It's easy to put on here, not straight, so straightforward to do. <coughs> so, I'm going to get you to, before we go into the next bit. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to go off into, what I'd like you to do, I'd like you to go into, first of all, your attachment style groups. So, team up with someone who's your attachment style. You sort of know that reasonably well now. Um, Actually, how about you go into your groups and you can have a group of two or three, no more than three really, so you get a chance to discuss. <clears throat> and then I'll tell you what to do. Into groups, then I'll tell you what to do so you don't have to remember. Okay? Grab a coffee if you want.